recurring theme of this show is Democratic Party hypocrisy. Another is how U.S. media outlets, including social media outlets, are just another arm of the state. More than any official arm of the U.S. government, the media carry out the most insidious and horrible examples of fascism. Matt Taibbi on Substack routinely addresses both. We'll begin with portions of this piece. The YouTube ban is un-American, wrong, and will backfire. Silicon Valley couldn't have designed a better way to further radicalize Trump voters. Start with the headline, Supporting the 2020 U.S. Election. YouTube in its company blog can't even say, Banning election conspiracy theories. They have to employ the Orwellian language of politicians. Healthy forests, clear skies, supported elections, because Google and YouTube are now political actors who can't speak plainly any more than a drunk can walk in a straight line. The company wrote Wednesday, Yesterday was the safe harbor deadline for the U.S. presidential election, and enough states have certified their election results to determine a president-elect. Given that, we will start removing any piece of content uploaded today or any time after that misleads people by alleging that widespread fraud or errors changed the outcome of the 2020 U.S. presidential election. For example, we will remove videos claiming that a presidential candidate won the election due to widespread software glitches or counting errors. This announcement came down at roughly the same time Hunter Biden was announcing that his tax affairs were under investigation by the U.S. attorney in Delaware. Part of that investigation concerned whether or not he had violated tax and money laundering laws in, as CNN put it, foreign countries, principally China. Information suggestive of money laundering and tax issues in China and other countries was in the cache of emails reported in the New York Post story blocked by Twitter and Facebook. That news was denounced as Russian disinformation by virtually everyone in reputable media who often dismissed the story with an aristocratic snort a la Christiana Amanpour. I've already played you this video, so I'll let you go to Matt's article and click on it yourself. But I'll have to say, she is insufferable. Her elitist condescension is an exact representation of the Democratic Party writ large. That tale was not Russian disinformation, however, and Biden's announcement this week strongly suggests Twitter and Facebook suppressed a real story of legitimate public interest just before a presidential election. How important was that Hunter Biden story? That's debatable, but the fact that tech companies blocked it and professional journalists gleefully lied about it has a direct bearing on YouTube's decision now to bar Trumpist freakouts over the election results. If you want a population of people to stop thinking an election was stolen from them, it's hard to think of a worse method than ordering a news blackout after it's just been demonstrated that the last major blackout was a fraud. Close your eyes and imagine what would have happened if Facebook and Google had banned 9-11 truth on the advice of intelligence officials in the Bush years, and it will start to make sense that Trump voters in Guy Fox masks are now roaming the continent like buffalo. The YouTube decision also came on the same day that former CIA officer Evan McMullen tweeted this. One of the most critical to-do items for the American democracy movement over the next four years will be to more effectively counter domestic anti-democracy disinformation. Not foreign, domestic. If possible, it should be done on both the supply and demand sides. We can't ignore this issue any longer. Dun, dun, dun. McMullen was the never-Trump conservative who ran for president in 2016 and received glowing coverage from the Washington Post and other outlets as the man who stands a fair chance of stealing the red state of Utah from GOP nominee Donald Trump. The same outlet that blasted Jill Stein's fairy tale candidacy had Josh Rogan write a slobbering blowjob profile of McMullen just before the 2016 election, hailing his steady personality, honesty, and work ethic, and gushing at the possibility that he might become the first third party candidate to win a state since 1968. That, Rogan noted without irony, might be his most successful covert operation. Intelligence officers like McMullen have spent much of the last four years conditioning the public to accept the idea that aggressive steps need to be taken to stop foreign disinformation or foreign interference in the media landscape most of all. 
a move to stop domestic anti-democracy disinformation on both the supply and demand sides, WTF, is a serious escalation of that idea. Signs pointed to this moment coming. This past August, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released an assessment that foreign countries were seeking to spread disinformation in the run-up to the election. In October, Virginia Democrat and former CIA official Abigail Spanberger piggybacked on that report and introduced a bill designed to cut down on foreign disinformation. The law, among other things, would require that political ads or content produced by foreign governments be marked by disclaimers and that companies should remove any such content appearing without disclaimers. It would also expand language in the Foreign Agents Registration Act, FARA, requiring that any content intended to influence U.S. citizens politically be reported to the Department of Justice. Stipulate that this is all above board, that there's nothing odd about the Department of Justice monitoring political ads or registering content creators or permanent bureaucrats and intelligence agencies publishing their takes on which presidential candidate is preferred by conniving foreign adversary nations. The United States has survived a long time without such procedures, but sure, an argument can be made that any country has an interest in alerting its citizens to foreign messaging. Where it gets weird is when the effort to stamp out foreign interference is transferred to the domestic media landscape. Intelligence agencies, think tanks, and mainstream news agencies have been preparing us for this concept for years as well. This dates back to the infamous 2016 Washington Post story hyping Prop or Not, a shadowy organization that identified a long list of homegrown American news sites like Consortium, Truthdig, Naked Capitalism, and Antiwar.com as vehicles for Russian propaganda. Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal two years ago insisted the Russians in attempting to disrupt our lives will use American voices. No longer the broken English, no longer the payment in rubles. They will become ever more astute in their attacks. Think tanks began hyping ideas about domestic origin disinformation and foreign countries co-opting authentic American voices. As time passed in the Trump years, we started reading on a regular basis that Russian propaganda efforts would be harder to detect because they would be routed through people appearing on the outside like Nexus 6 replicants to be ordinary human Americans. In late February earlier this year, at the peak of the preposterous campaign to depict Bernie Sanders as a favorite of the Kremlin, David Sanger of the New York Times warned that Russians were purposefully sending messages through everyday Americans because it is much harder to ban the words of real Americans. Lee Camp, I hope you read this article. When the bulwark, basically the reanimated corpse of Bill Kristol's Weekly Standard, wrote some weeks back about Donald Trump holding a maskless anti-democracy disinformation rally straight out of Vladimir Putin's dreams, that language wasn't accidental. This was part of a PR campaign, years in the making, preparing us for the idea that domestic voices can be just as dangerous as foreign ones and similarly need to be stamped out. The YouTube announcement is the latest salvo in the fight against domestic anti-democracy information, and the first of many problems with it is its hypocrisy. Do I personally believe the 2020 election was stolen from Donald Trump? No. Well, I'll break in here and say, probably, because I saw what they did to Bernie and they used the same election ballot machines. But go ahead, Matt, you can say no if you like, because you're not as crazy as I am. However, I also didn't believe the election was stolen from Hillary Clinton in 2016 when the internet was bursting at the seams with conspiracy theories nearly identical to the ones now being propagated by Trump fans. Here's a tweet from Daniel Nazer. It's stunning how perfectly the Palmer Report's coverage in 2016 matches today's MAGA conspiracies, but Democratic state attorneys general were not stupid enough to submit it to the Supreme Court. Rigged election. Two Wisconsin voting blocks had more ballots cast than registered voters, from the Palmer Report. Math error in Wisconsin County hints at how state may have been rigged for Donald Trump. That was all from 2016. Unrestrained speculation about the illegitimacy of the 2016 election had a major impact on the public. 
Surveys showed 50% of Clinton voters by December of 2016 believed the Russians actually hacked vote tallies in states, something no official agency ever alleged even at the peak of the Russiagate madness. Two years later, one in three Americans believed a foreign power would change vote tallies in the 2018 midterm elections. So, dear viewers and listeners, you can see how this fits perfectly into the larger theme of how Americans are manipulated by the media. I've said before that Noam Chomsky had that part exactly right. Caitlin Johnstone also writes brilliantly on this subject. There is no more powerful way to control the world than through manipulation by the media especially when they have to pretend that our consent means something. In a supposed democracy, the consent of the masses is crucial. But is manufactured consent really consent? No, it's gaslighting psychopathy. That's all it is. People lie to you and you believe them and then you get taken advantage of. And now on to the theme of Democratic Party hypocrisy. Amazing hypocrisy. Democrats make wreck of COVID-19 relief negotiations. Democrats stonewalled all year on a new pandemic relief package. Now they're proposing a new plan that undercuts even Republican proposals and screws everyone, but get this, defense contractors. Oh, the Democratic Party would never do that, now would they? Nobody on CNN is telling me this. Rachel Maddow's not telling me this. How could this possibly be true? Must be Russian interference. A senior Democratic congressional aide is irate tonight. The Democrats, the aide seethed, have just done the worst negotiating in modern history. At issue, a pair of new COVID-19 relief bills just submitted by a bipartisan group of senators. Republican Senator Susan Collins gushed that a Christmas miracle allowed the two parties to come together on the twin bills, which the press describes as totaling $748 billion and $160 billion, respectively. Bipartisanship and compromise is sick. Alive and well in Washington, clucked West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin. It sure is. With the election over, the Democratic leadership in the space of a few weeks somehow negotiated against themselves, working with Republicans to push the total amount of a COVID-19 relief deal further and further downward to the point where previous plans offered by the likes of Mitch McConnell and Steve Mnuchin now look like LBJ's great society. I have to mention in passing, Matt, you're a really good writer, and that's a pretty good statement from someone as irascible as I am. Democrats ultimately settled for less than a third of what they had set as a baseline for state and local aid, accepted a package without any $1,200 direct payments, and signed off on a plan that, after offsets, includes less than $350 billion in new money, well below a slew of pre-election proposals rejected by Democrats like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer as being too low. They totally caved, the aide says. Maybe this aide should run for president. Back in May, the Democrat-led House passed the HEROES Act, a $3.4 trillion relief package that was pitched as the bill Democrats really wanted. It contained $413 billion new dollars for $1,200 direct payments to citizens, as well as $437 billion in additional unemployment benefits, and a whopping $1.13 trillion for state and local governments. Trump said the bill was dead on arrival, McConnell blasted it as a $3 trillion left-wing wish list, and the anti-spending group Taxpayers for Common Sense seethed that Democrats unrealistically put everything they could think of in the bill. Still, Democrats insisted this was the right amount at the right time, a moral necessity. The House has passed a major bill dealing with COVID, Schumer said in May, blasting his Senate Republican colleagues for a pause in negotiations. We have done nothing. Republicans via McConnell countered in July with the unfortunately named HEALS Act, reported as a roughly $1 trillion aid deal. The bill included another round of $1,200 relief checks. Pelosi in August ripped the plan as meager measures and said Republicans were refusing to take action to feed hungry children. So here's the pot calling the kettle black. Nancy Pelosi says, Republicans refused to take action to feed hungry children nationwide during this pandemic, but they did make sure to give business a massive tax break for corporate lunches. 
When Republicans ended up backing a so-called skinny $650 billion deal, it was reported as a signal that the GOP opposition was determined not to budge above what the Trump administration was willing to offer, at the time rumored to be somewhere between one and one and a half trillion dollars. In September, as time wound down toward election day, the bipartisan Problem Solvers Group released a $1.5 trillion aid plan, which they pitched as a version of that theoretical compromise between Democratic and Republican positions. Though the group contained some Democrats, it was dismissed by party leadership. A group of Democratic committee chairs, including Maxine Waters, Carolyn Maloney, and Frank Pallone, released an unusual statement denouncing the Problem Solvers Plan, saying it falls short of what is needed to save lives and boost the economy. I don't know about you, dear readers and viewers, but I'm already jumping to the conclusion that Nancy Pelosi just wanted to make life difficult for Donald Trump and wanted to make sure he didn't get reelected. Maybe that's a little too cynical of me to think that. Democrats countered soon after by passing an updated version of the HEROES Act that offered $2.2 trillion in relief. The Republicans, this time led by Steve Mnuchin and an increasingly desperate-seeming Donald Trump, came back on October 9th with a $1.8 trillion proposal. Reeling as he stumbled toward Election Day thanks to a series of missteps and scandals, Trump seemed anxious to go beyond his previous numbers if it meant he'd get to sign more checks before Election Day. Here's a tweet. COVID relief negotiations are moving along. Go big, Donald Trump. This time, even some prominent Democrats were insisting the time was right to strike. We're in a place where we should be able to do a deal, said California's Ro Khanna. We have a moral obligation to do something. The Democratic leadership disagreed. It was reported that Pelosi was now insisting on at least $436 billion in state and local aid, and the Mnuchin plan of $300 billion for states and localities just wouldn't cut it. In a Dear Colleagues letter on October 10th, Pelosi described Trump as more interested in taking credit than passing an aid plan. When the president talks about wanting a bigger relief package, his proposal appears to mean that he wants more money at his discretion to grant or withhold, rather than agreeing on language prescribing how we honor our workers, crush the virus, and put money in the pockets of workers. Oh yeah, that's what you wanted to do, Nancy. Ultimately, of course, no deal got done before the election. After the election, the Democrats put two of their most conservative members, Manchin and Virginia's Mark Warner, in charge of negotiating the COVID-19 relief bill. Hey, I wonder why they picked them instead of Ro Khanna. Hmm. Manchin is the guy who just responded to reports that Trump wanted to give out more money in direct payments by saying he thought it was a bad idea to give out stimulus checks and not supplemental unemployment relief. Manchin and Warner repped the Democrats in the bipartisan group that included Republicans Collins from Maine, Lisa Murkowski from Alaska, and Bill Cassidy from Louisiana. Their New Deal unveiled today makes little sense in the context of all of those prior negotiations. Remember all of that state and local funding that Democrats insisted was so crucial to the aid package? Today, the state and local aid package signed off on by Manchin and Warner is down to $160 billion appropriated as part of a separate bill that may or may not pass at all with the main $748 billion plan. In other words, Democrats just agreed to take seven times less than the $1.13 trillion they asked for in the HEROES Act and about half of Mnuchin's $300 billion offer in October that Pelosi rejected as sadly inadequate. As for that $748 billion bill, according to the senior Democratic aide who pointed to comments made by Mitt Romney, it includes $560 billion in offsets repurposed from March's CARES Act. In other words, the aide says, the $748 billion deal is really just $188 billion in new money. Given all the high-flown rhetoric the party devoted before Election Day to rejecting aid packages they deemed heartlessly small, the hypocrisy, he says, is amazing. If you include the $160 billion package for state and local aid, the New Deal offers a maximum of $348 billion in new money, well below some of the better offers they received from Republicans over the summer and fall, and on par instead with the very worst GOP proposals, like that skinny bill passed in September, which netted out to $300 billion after offsets. Conspicuously absent? As CNBC put it, 
the deal lacks one key area of aid, the $1,200 direct payment checks that seemingly everyone on the Hill claimed to want from Trump to McConnell to Pelosi. Those are gone from the Christmas miracle, but fear not because the bill didn't screw over everyone heading into the holidays. You can find this little nugget on the last line of the summary of the Bipartisan COVID-19 Relief Act of 2020. Allow intelligence and defense contractors to have flexible contracts during the COVID-19 pandemic. There are no direct payments for regular working people, people living off tips, the aide says, but they made sure there's a provision in there to help defense contractors who aren't working right now. They get what they're looking for. With the orange one on his way out of the White House, denying the president a political win is no longer even theoretically important. Because of this, there's a school of thought that this deal is revealing something important about how Democrats want to lead under Biden. You think? That is, willing and or anxious to work with Republicans on programs signaling fiscal restraint and away from aggressive social programming ideas of the type favored by the party's progressive voters. Ding, ding, ding! Maybe that's not the case, and this is an aberration, but it sure seems like the Democratic leadership went out of its way to take less once it was finally safe to demand more. If all this doesn't signify to you that we need a revolution, I don't know what will. I don't see why anyone would worry if Nancy Pelosi didn't become the Speaker of the House. We feed them. Pelosi certainly doesn't seem to have any intention to feed anybody. But she'll certainly keep eating that gourmet ice cream out of her fabulous refrigerators. Yeah, just another signal that it's absolutely Guy Fawkes time.